Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Wing King Wong, MIT class of 1984, founder and president of the MIT Chinese Alumni Group. I will moderate this webinar. The topic today is data, AI and privacy risk. We are pleased to present Mr. Arno Chu, who is MIT class of 1978 with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and computer science. Arnold also has a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from UC Berkeley. Arnold first studied AI under pioneers such as Jerry Sussman, Marvin Minsky, and Patrick Winston at the MIT AI Lab. After graduating from MIT and UC Berkeley, Arnold worked on AI application to avionics maintenance at Allied Signal. When Arnold's career veered towards finance, he promoted AI on Wall Street while at Bear Stearns. Arnold now works for the Federal Housing and Finance Agency. He actively prototypes AI applications within the agency and contributes to the interagency community of practice focus on AI and privacy. Arnold will speak for about 30 minutes about AI privacy risk and emerging approaches towards mitigating this risk. He will focus on the intersection of technology and policy. There will be many opportunities for individuals to innovate and devise solutions for specific domains. Therefore, Arnold will also discuss different paths for the audience to join the AI revolution. Q&A will follow his presentation. You may post your questions now in the Q&A box. You can also upvote the questions that you like. And now, here is Arnold Chu. Hi, good evening, everybody. I've got a great chance here to show everybody some of my uh, recent work. Um, as uh, we mentioned, um, a lot of this uh, actually outgrow from um, my interagency work um, on the um, AI community practice, which has been um, started through the uh, GSA General Service Administration. Um, and uh, uh, there's uh, several working groups, and this particular one I've been working on deals with a uh, privacy issue. And um, I just want to share some of our um, ideas and um, approaches to how to think about such issues. Um, as well, as we mentioned, that uh, uh, we will explore a little bit more about different opportunities depending on uh, where you are meeting in your career journey or in your professional life and so forth. So. Um, but uh, before I get started, I, I did see that um, from kind of the preliminary discussion, um, many people have this type of um, uh, question. Um, um, and it's the uh, kind of the um, Terminator question, right? Uh, they said, is it possible that uh, sometime in the future that uh, the AI would take over and, and end up enslaving mankind? Now, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but I will give a, a um, uh, my uh, prediction or, or my forecast for how things might turn out. So uh, you can look forward to that at the end of the talk. Uh, let me uh, set up the beginning of the slide here. Give me a minute. There we go. Great. So is the uh, slide, Carol, clear? Looks good, Wien. Okay. Um, so we are uh, talking about um, from the perspective of the public sector, for public, uh, um, um, primarily the federal government. Um, and I uh, just want to remind a little bit on the, um, what the functions of government is because um, there, there are a lot of um, conventionals or kind of uh, association people of government. 
Um, but if you strip everything down, the fundamental um, functionings of, uh, of working government really is, is these type of basic um, um, uh, uh, emphasis or focal points. The number one is protecting the safety of the citizens. And number two is setting up laws and rules and regulation to manage any conflicts that arise. Um, and third is uh, setting up and providing basic um, services, infrastructures, you know, roads, uh, electricity, and so forth. And the fourth one, very important one, is setting up a benchmark and standards um, that um, for the private sectors to follow. And then the fifth one is actually helping the entire society move forward through funding different kinds of researches. Uh, and AI has been gradually uh, growing uh, within the uh, federal government. And in fact, there's been uh, some effort in setting up some um, fun, uh, basic policies regarding uh, AI. And in particular, last year in 2020, um, there was a executive order specifically emphasizing the idea of trustworthy AI, meaning that um, the policy of the United States is to promote innovation and use of AI where appropriate to improve government operations and services in a manner that falls the public trust, build confidence in the AI, protects our nation's value, and remain consistent with all applicable laws including those related to privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. And as part of the Trustworthy AI Initiative, it includes um, values such as uh, fairness, eliminating bias, uh, transparencies, explainability, and accountability. So this is just a very brief overview on the evolving um, governmental policy regarding uh, AI applications. Um, and uh, uh, the, to dig into uh, uh, a lot of these areas would uh, require uh, quite quite a few talks, actually. Um, but in today, we specifically focus on the issue of uh, privacy. Um, and um, uh, to kind of prep us to think about the um, an organized way about um, how AI and technology is uh, impacting uh, different kinds of privacy risks. We should think a little about how how we got here. You know, what is the what is the trends that drive toward our current situation? Um, many people say it, uh, we have a, a, a dilemma on our hand. Uh, one part of that is that uh, we're increasingly seeing many areas of our lives being digitized, and uh, what used to be on paper uh, often now becomes digital. Right. Lots of documents being signed digitally instead of going to a notaries and uh, going to a lawyer and signing a piece of paper. And because they're digital now, which means that lots of those data is actually being collected and stored somewhere. And secondly, um, as many of you would know, Moore's Law is talking about the exponential increases in computation capability and storage capability. Um, people keep forecasting the end of it, that we can hit a uh, hot stop at some point, but we're not there yet. We're still increasing um, at exponential rate in terms of computing capability and storage capability. And this increase is giving us a lot of new um, opportunities. And these opportunity is uh, definitely taken advantage of by AI technology, uh, the computational power, and also uh, there are some steady uh, advances in the AI algorithm itself, which have now bring unsolvable problem now becoming solvable. Um, lots of things that we couldn't imagine trying to do before, we can attempt to do and in some cases have successes. And it's very important to note that um, we, we are innovating and there are many, many real benefit people have experienced because of this. Um, and in fact, the, um, is, uh, the AI is uh, becoming fairly pervasive, I would not say in every single application, but lots of times it's working behind the scene and um, you're reaping the benefit of it without 
actually even um, realizing it. Some example um, includes things like uh, uh, many research um, areas that a lot of work in AI applied to drug research or, or um, uh, medical device research. So all these have occur in the background. You only see the final product, but you don't realize how AI have contributed in, in the process. But the problem is as AI being applied to more and more areas, um, people have started to notice and, and be worried about different kinds of potential harm to the individuals. Um, it takes on different kinds of role and that it uh, give rise to different kind of risk uh, to privacy. So specifically when I talk about AI risk of privacy, I'm talking about that in specific applications of AI technique resulting in harms to individuals and societies. Now, for the government's perspective, the government's interest related to this um, is also um, uh, from a multiple perspective. There are different kinds of roles that government um, has to play. One is definitely as a user, user of technology itself, um, and also as a regulator, for uh, industry using the AI, AI technology and, and how they're using it and the result from the use. Um, and also legislation, there, there are new uh, law being uh, evaluated uh, all the time. Um, I believe there's uh, another um, rule being uh, proposed in Congress this even just this week. And then finally, um, because of the many benefits AI technology has, Government wants to be a supporter, meaning supporting research, supporting application, and um, and so in many cases supplying data. Actually, that's a critical role that uh, the government also has. So, um, to because there are so many different kinds of possible risk, um, I came over. Uh, um, high level taxonomy to talk about the different kinds of risk and um, help us focus more on what kind of solution may be necessary for one kind of risk versus another. Um, so each type relates to the kind of role the AI plays. So the first one um, I named the panopticon, which means that basically that um, uh, there's IoT devices everywhere and um, there are cameras, there's uh, Fitbits, uh, there are all type of uh, data collection devices, um, both in the physical world and also in the online world. And the AI aspect of it means that it makes it much easier to monitor and digest many, many different streams of data in many places on many individuals. So it's uh, from the uh, um, uh, from the perspective uh, uh, reference, the, the um, it's like uh, having the um, uh, all-seeing eye. The second type of risk uh, relates to um, the AI's capability to access and steal personal private information. Uh, I call this the master key and uh, more and more AI techniques being used um, in actually in both in defending, trying to protect personal data and also to hack it and access it. So uh, this will be uh, going on tit for tat pretty much uh, forever. The third part, which often uh, people have um, been uh, discussed uh, quite often, particularly in the area related to uh, fairness uh, and biases, is the oracle. Many times AI techniques is used as an oracle, meaning that um, you, you want to infer some specific personal attributes or personal behavior um, based on other information about the individual. Okay, now the, the, and the issue occurs whether even if the prediction is perfectly accurate or if it's poor, not very accurate, there can be a problem arising from both types of situations. Um, 
we'll explore more in depth in, in each of these uh, categories uh, in, the, in the future slides. Number four is siren. A uh, siren means that AI technology itself can actually entice people to give up more and more data about themselves. And since AI feeds on data, basically the siren role of AI is that it's generating more data that can feed itself and prove this for whatever purposes the, uh, the owner of the AI technology wants to use them for. And the fifth one is the avatar or avatar maker, meaning that, uh, that there is a unprecedented capability to make um, fake persons, uh, either online or on video, um, or you know, whether it's a, a live person, a dead person, or even a purely fictitious so a person that has never existed. But we, we have truly amazing technology to make that look like a real person is there. So I'm going to go a little bit in, in uh, detail on each of these and give a number of examples. So Panopticon. Um, you may be familiar with the word Panopticon. And originally, um, it was proposed by uh, Jeremy Bentham. Um, his idea was for a either a, a mental institution, the prison. A panopticon is a design where a um, control tower uh, is a hub. It's a ring, uh, sorry, not a, a hub and uh, spoke uh, configuration. And the controller sits in the middle and it can look down, the guard in there can look down every single wing with no obstruction and see all the um, inmates uh, in the uh, uh, inside the institution. And while at the same time, the inmates themselves do not know if they are being observed or not. Okay. Um, as a brief aside, some, uh, some of you might also have heard the term panopticon used in, as in, uh, in Doctor Who and uh, pretty much the similar, similar idea since uh, Within that particular universe, uh, people in Gallifrey has uh, unprecedented access to um, everything that occurs in the world, in the universe, and, and in the past and future. So, um, now we are definitely approaching uh, this state um, because we have installed many, many different surveillance devices uh, in all parts of our life. Um, you have your, your Apple watches, and then there are um, cameras, and you have these uh, uh, nest and ring um, type of um, doorbell, camera doorbell now. And um, in a particular way, this could be a problem, just as an example, is that um, if you have a neighborhood that's made up of uh, many people who have shared the ring camera data and they allow um, uh, perhaps a, a, a neighborhood patrol group access to the data, they could use it to monitor pedestrian crossing to the neighborhood and deciding based on what they think and what the people look like, whether they were gonna go challenge them, okay? So you, you can see the potential or problem there. And it's much more widespread than perhaps you, you realize. Um, Specifically with the ring uh, doorbell or camera systems, um, the, the Amazon itself actually has partnered with more than 2000 local US police and fire departments, meaning that they uh, have an agreement to share data with them. And that um, the, the videos recorded in your own, uh, your own doorbell, um, you, you can allow access by say the local uh, police department and uh, go back in whatever, two days, see what was going on in certain hours. Um, and in some cases, uh, there's, uh, there's supposed to be control and you're supposed to have a, approval, uh, rights to approve or disapprove this access. But there also have been cases where the, um, the, the since actually the video is not stored on your device, it's stored in some 
Amazon uh, server somewhere. Uh, there have been cases that of improper access of such video too. So um, you can imagine the potential of if uh, any hacker can get control of this type of data. So uh, that's just one example of panoply. There, there are many more that you can probably think of. Um, the mass key aspect of the risk relates to the, um, the fact that we, we have digital data and then there'll be hackers that want to get at those data. They want to steal it or they want to change it and manipulate it. Um, example, uh, you uh, may, may not know, there's actually been technology developed, uh, which is, is based on the, uh, the needs of um, uh, people that uh, uh, needs constant monitoring. Um, and uh, like uh, whether it's the ICU or an individual home, um, there's now techniques to use a traumatic wave detect heartbeat within the um, that particular house within the or that particular uh, hospital room. And in fact, the technology uses AI and they can count how many heart there's distinct heartbeats is going on there, and they can tell roughly the movement of the heartbeats. Okay, so. Um, so you can imagine that if a um, um, burglar has access to this type of technology, it would be very easy for them to tell if anybody's um, actually inside a house or if they have all left the house and that they would know when is the best time to actually go burglar your house. Okay. Um, so this, um, this is almost like science fiction, right? Like that kind of, kind of a, and Star Trek detecting life signs, you know, but but we're getting there, <laughs> so it's it's pretty amazing. Um, but even more, uh, perhaps even more worrisome, is that um, the AI technique themselves uh, or, or a AI hacker is uh, probably under development uh, in in many many different. Um, particularly, especially nation state uh, actors. Um, in 2017, um, there was a um, well-known convention called DEF CON. This is a hacker conference that all the black and white hats people get together. And um, uh, on the 2017 um, convention, they actually had a hacking contest for different kind of um, computer-based, you know, AI, basically AI, hacking software with a total price of $2 million, okay? And in particular, uh, the winner of that specific contest was a program called Mayhem. Uh, but obviously remember, there are also other competitors too, which might be still pretty good even if they win the final price. Now, um, obviously this 2017 and research is continuing on this, um, uh, in these areas. And even just a small part <clears throat> of the mayhem technique, uh, we can see it can have very serious consequences. So one of the researcher, Bromley, um, he looked at 2000 router firmwares. Okay, uh, firmware is like the, uh, um, the, um, like the fixed program on, on the chips inside, inside your, your hardware device, like a router. <clears throat> and using some of the techniques uh, that Paul Mayhem, he found that 40% that, uh, of these uh, firmware over 89 different products had at least one vulnerability. And 14 of these were previously undiscovered vulnerabilities. So in other words, um, the potential for AI techniques to help hacker is, is just at the very beginning stage and it's gonna grow uh, much, much, uh, much more in the years to come. Now, the Oracle has actually, in many ways, uh, uh, maybe uh, most most of you are, might be most familiar with actually. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, the most common actually is is uh, being talked about is uh, getting credit, you know, getting getting a loan. 
Um, but another one you can think about is um, the because of ubiquitous collection of travel data, um, uh, travel cameras, um, the uh, your GPS uh, um, uh, trail as you as you travel. Um, these are these are data that when people have access to, they could infer things about you, which may may not be true. You know, for example, if uh, LEO here is law enforcement officers, if a local the police department has uh, a capability to track your travel pattern, your uh, Apple Watch or what, whatever you're, you're using, uh, or your phone, you know, um, and they can monitor your travel patterns and they find that you were uh, near some protest event, um, well, they might uh, find you a much much more likely to be a person of interest, uh, somebody to monitor to see um, if you have a, any substantial role in, in, in the protest event itself. Right? In the ultimate case, obviously, you, you can think of the, the scheme or, or the, the scenario in the film Minority Report where, where um, a uh, law enforcement agency would actually try to predict your behavior, whether you commit a crime based on many attributes, including uh, things about yourself, your behavior and your travel and other incidences going on around you. Um, going back a little bit too, it's, it's not purely a um, um, governmental uh, uh, policing function. There are a lot of issues related to um, private sector, private sector action. So we talk about granting loans, right? So a number of years ago, actually, uh, it was almost five, one or five years now, Facebook actually took a patent where um, the patent is the idea of a new type of credit granting model based on non-traditional attributes. So um, the pattern talked about considering criterion for granting credit, such as your behavior pattern. Do you engage in high risk behaviors? And um, you know, all different kinds of non-traditional um, uh, tragedy, probably things like your, your social uh, network profiles. You know? And uh, one interesting thing that people were very concerned about is um, uh, they might look at your friends' uh, credit rating as a uh, as way to estimate what your credit rating would be. So, I mean, effectively, this is a uh, uh, similar to the social credit that uh, people talked about that China is implemented in, in some in some uh, small fashions. Um, so the the issue with this is that obviously their forecast may or may not be correct. But nonetheless, it can be very consequential to your particular life, whether you can get a mortgage or not, right? So that's a, um, and then that's could be bad in both ways. You know, if they're being profligate in granting credit, they're gonna go bust. But if they're too tight or if there are any built-in biases, then, you know, you may suffer as a consequence. So. Uh, Simon's a pretty interesting one. And uh, it's been around quite a long time, but I think people are just starting to realize it. Um, the most uh, direct example that most people are familiar with be uh, Alexa or Ceres. Um, and uh, even more, more so though, I see many, many um, uh, government agencies and also uh, company are setting up chatbots. And these chatbots are, are not just the um, uh, uh, telephone, you know, push a button, A or for this or B for that. I mean, one or two or three type of thing. They're, they're much more sophisticated. They actually um, have uh, support natural language interactions. So uh, that means you you can fall into the false sense that you're dialoguing with a real person. And because of that, you may be much more willing to share information um, than if it was a, a um, an automated device, or, or these are uh, these, uh, phone interaction. And here's a very interesting example of this. Um, uh, some of you may know about the uh, company Ashley Mad Madison. Um, it was started um, as a uh, website that helped mattress uh, people 
they're interesting in having uh, basically extramarital affairs. Now, I'm not going to put any um, ethical judgment on that. However, some hackers did. So the, these hackers that did not like their business model actually hacked into the Ashley Madison uh, software and extracted a large dump of, of data. And uh, because of the dump, people got a glimpse into how uh, this, uh, this, this system actually worked. And what is interesting is that um, uh, the analysis of this is that the, uh, there, they have many, uh, many male uh, customers on it, but in terms of female customer, customers, is actually many of them are not real people. Many are up to like um, some estimate that 70,000 uh, of the purportedly human customers are actually um, female bots, meaning that they are programmed to respond to male customers and set them millions of fake messages, trying to um, give them an illusion that there's a person on the other side that they might be able to, you know, build some relationship with, okay? So you can imagine in that kind of a context, how much information you get from, from the individuals. And uh, also very recent is the avatar maker um, thread uh, where people can make um, false images, videos, and even um, social media trails. So some re example, you might have uh, seen that there's a, um, there was some video made putting uh, Linda Carter, the, the original TV Wonder Woman in the new Wonder Woman uh, videos or trailers. So, or people adding Anthony Baldine's his voiceover in the recent documentary after he's dead because um, they're able to extract his verbal quality using AI technology. And, um, uh, and I believe the text was his written, but uh, they, they add his voice uh, to, to do a voiceover documentary and, and it's after he's dead. So, and also people have done uh, interesting research using uh, ironically Philip K's Dick's head and um, very interesting case, but limited time, I won't go into it unless somebody asks me about it. Now, here's another uh, example. You can see visually how good it is. This is also pretty recent. You can see is on the CNN uh, uh, business news. In fact, somebody used the AI technology to create a series of fake video of Tom Cruise um, talking to apparently you on TikTok, <laughs> which confuses millions of TikTok users. So you can believe it's pretty convincing. So the, uh, having gone through a little bit of the different kinds of risks, let's talk a little bit about things that we can do to try to mitigate um, the, the, the harms. And to do that, let's take a quick look at how um, AI uh, translate data into decisions or, or um, specific actions. So on the uh, left-hand side, um, we have lots of sensor, different IoT devices collecting data. We also have people's behavioral data, um, like your you know, click-throughs and, uh, um, and any kind of biometric uh, uh, behavior. Um, and then obviously there are huge amount of uh, textual documents, textual and graphical documents that, that are already available. And the trend is the for different agency and company to form a data lake with all this information. And the idea of data lake is they want to keep the data around um, without necessarily knowing exactly what they were using for because they, they trust, they believe that they will find a good use for it later on. Okay. This is very different from the previous data collection uh, mindset. Now, based on all these data uh, available, then the different um, uh, companies or government agencies would construct uh, AI models. The model themselves could impact specific decisions or um, evaluations. Um, and um, and, uh, in, and there's a, 
specific, there's a special use case in the bottom that I talk about the anonym, anonym, anonymization. And um, this has to do with the fact that a lot of the data, uh, the different companies and government do try to add some protection by anonymizing it, meaning they, they take out specific personal identifiable information. However, with additional, many additional um, uh, data sets available and also AI technique, that itself can also defeat the anonymization effort and actually de-anonymize a specific individual. So here's a big overview of um, uh, how the whole uh, uh, processes work. And um, um, so far, uh, these are some kinds of mitigations uh, um, people have been researching, developing, um, depending on the different kinds of phases of that uh, uh, AI model building. Um, the first part is data collection. Some basically good principle is data minimization, you, meaning you only collect what you need and you only retain it for as long as you need to. And then possibly tokenization means that substituting something else for the actual data or for the information. Uh, it's similar to data in the intermediary, which is like a, either a device or another um, institution that helps intermediate uh, and hide the uh, detail plus uh, PII types of information. Um, another big area um, of work is uh, IoT security. Many of these IoT devices are Russia in a hurry to make money, so their security is often very poor. And uh, fortunately, uh, uh, organization like IEEE is working hard on the setting up some standards in these areas. Um, in the data storage phase, in talking about the data lake or in the intermediate databases, um, people have to apply encryption so that it's not so easily hacked. And also, um, uh, a big principle should be actually decentralization, not storing all your data in one basket, meaning that even if you have, you only lose a little bit of data. And also it's not necessarily under the control of one single actor. Right? So, um, so these are good principles to follow to, to mitigate uh, potential harm. And then uh, the following is a little more technical. Uh, there are new um, computing techniques to do anonymizations and uh, either uh, synthetic data, meaning created um, data that has similar attributes to the real one, but does not really tie to any specific individual. And uh, data poisoning talks about the uh, part of the, um, uh, the adding additional data to either trace or or makes the creation of certain types of AI model um, uh, ineffective. But overall, there's a lot of um, basically model governance work that needs, needs to be done and uh, is uh, gradually being built up both in private sector and in the public sector. It is, those are more policy oriented types of um, approaches. And then there are also specific technological tools too. Um, some of the ones that people have done a lot of research on is differential privacy, adding some noises, um, federated learning, which means which ties in with the decentralized data scheme where you, uh, you train not with all of the data in one place, but you train the data in different places and then bring the trained um, uh, the neural network uh, back into one place. Homomorphic encryption is a new uh, technique where you can actually train directly on encrypted data. You don't have to decrypt them first. That's an additional safety feature. Uh, and then, yeah, I mentioned synthetic data already. Um, See so the, uh, um, and there are definitely more, a lot of work being done on legislation on how to handle uh, data and privacy. It's probably too many to mention, but the obviously most well-known one is uh, GDPR based out from, from EU. And um, you can see there, there, there are a lot of problems, and but there are also a lot of 
uh, avenue for solutions. Um, and no single, there's no goal, there's no golden bullet. Um, the ultimately I see is going to be combination of technology standards and also the laws uh, to deal with all the different kinds of privacy challenges. That means that there are going to be many new niches for technological and conceptual innovation, and that as AI is adopted in wider and wider places, um, there are more opportunity uh, to come up with your own ideas on how to mitigate and defend these risks. You know, think about how Apple is able to build a brand on protecting a uh, user's privacy. Um, not perfect, but certainly more than many other uh, uh, private enterprise. And it's, this is a, a kind of brand that people would be willing to pay for. So I see uh, um, evolving collaboration between entrepreneurs, civil organizations, and the government to mitigate these broad range of risk. Now, in terms of you thinking about uh, yourself, how uh, how you might want to get involved, um, uh, it uh, it depends a little bit on what your interest is. Um, there are some uh, very technical areas. If you want to develop new model, if you want to research uh, new techniques, then you definitely need to do um, some serious studies, uh, strengthen your mathematics statistics foundations, understand things like computation complexity, and um, really learn the many different kinds of AI techniques that people uh, have developed and are continuing to develop. But in contrast, if you have a somewhat different um, um, skill set or you're more um, people oriented, uh, so to speak, um, some a possible target to consider is uh, something more like a product manager or, or a business analyst uh, type of track where you focus more on the human centered design thinking, meaning about um, what is the uh, require, um, uh, what are the requirement in a particular environment and how uh, the particular AI techniques might uh, bring advantages, so bring automation, um, or and also what kind of um, potential harm you need to uh, design for, or what kind of um, uh, uh, buy-in you need to develop um, uh, from your users. So, uh, so that does require less specific AI detail technology, but enough understanding to work with the uh, all your user and consumer. A third one this is just as important as any other is the data management track or AI techniques built on data. I mean, the, the more the better, so to speak, is the current attitude. But to be useful, you must have good data quality control and governance uh, over the data that you collect and manage, and ideally probably be able to um, delete as, as required um, by law. And, and, um, and, um, if, and it's not purely a, um, and don't think of that as a purely a um, routine, um, a tedious job. Um, there can be a lot of room of creativity in the data management field, meaning that you can look for um, new and unique data that has, hasn't been collected for or find new and unique way to combine different types of data um, and use that as a basis to develop new product or, or new inferences. So. But another way to also think about uh, how you might want to be involved in, in the AI application is um, really just starting from, from where you are in, in your um, career track. I mean, if you are still in the college and pre professional phases, then obviously there are a lot of um, wide ranging um, uh, potential uh, avenue for you to go under. You know, there's certainly there are different degree programs. Um, the obvious one, like math statistics, perhaps less thought about is um, physics, as you're talking about a lot of physics major and not doing, doing AI work. And also operations research and mechanical engineering. In particular, mechanical engineering is very important now. Uh, since uh, the, the advent of uh, robotics, which is uh, much of the um, manufacturing 
sector has gone through automation to robotics and uh, there's a, a huge amount of AI that actually uh, involved in those uh, new devices. In fact, you may not realize uh, if you play with drones, there's actually a lot of AI in the drone, the drone software navigations. Um, if you're not in a uh, university program, there are various boot camps and vendors trainings. Those, those are good places to start. Um, and many, uh, many people also have asked me too from the finance world, um, uh, there are the actually adopting uh, air technology very fast. So, um, some of the early ones uh, work has been uh, into uh, things like sentiment analysis using natural language processing, meaning that people will look for scan a wide range of news sources, or maybe even uh, Twitter polls to get how people feel about particular stock. Do they like it? Are they, are they getting saw on it? Things like that. Um, and then all sorts of different alternate data um, uh, is, is uh, used to try to glean that little ex extra alpha out um, uh, from the um, uh, data that you have. These are very active area of research for many hedge funds, which understanding won't tell you that much about specifically what they're doing. Um, I just mentioned Bayesian in inference because this um, new area of um, um, uh, evaluating uncertain information. Um, and it's, uh, I, I see as a, as a um, potentially uh, a very productive avenue different from the neural network approach that uh, that has been uh, most well known so far. Um, another area that uh, you may not have thought about that if you are in the legal profession, uh, there are actually more and more application AI um, in different uh, characters. Um, so there are some uh, specific situations where AI's oracle nature um, is being applied, things like bail settings and um, um, you know, where do you give people bail or not? Um, and uh, where do you acquire bail or not, so forth. Um, and, uh, and then there's even more direct uh, applications for things like um, helping you uh, do search, semantic search, finding relevant cases, you know, patent office uh, has actually deployed a system to help them uh, find, um, for new patent application, find uh, a whole ranges of historical and other related patents to help them um, decide on the uh, analysis and, uh, and evaluation of new patents. Um, but there's another aspect uh, which uh, I touched on briefly before is that um, because of these, all these kind of privacy and other ethical issues that AI technology is causing, there's a lot of work that's gonna be required in terms of developing regulations and laws on um, the application and effects of artificial intelligence. So that's another way from a legal profession uh, to uh, get involved in, in these areas. Um, so here, here's my prediction. If you ask me why, what's gonna happen in the future, um, whether the Terminator would take over. Um, so I say this beginning and end, you may recognize this is Amazon's Astro Robot. So my prediction is that robot will gain entree to our home through cute little vaguely uh, animal or pet uh, uh, devices like this. And there's been a uh, previous one before, and this one is even more interactive in that it can actually follow you around <laughs> and blink his eye, make cute faces at you and so forth. Uh, this is the way um, robots uh, will worm their ways into our, our lives and our heart. Now, uh, but I predict this is not going to be the end. Um, as we know what happens on the internet, um, cats won, cats pictures won over dog picture. And, um, you know, if, if any of you actually owns a cat, I live with one, you probably have thought at one time or another, is the cat the pet or are you the pet for the cat where you are meeting all his or her needs? 
therefore, this is my final prediction that they will be the face of a future overlord, um, the robot cats. Anyway, that's it for the uh, uh, my presentation. I'm happy to have any more any chat or discussion with uh, with uh, you folks. There. We you're still on mute. Thank you so much, Anna, for a wonderful presentation. Kind of scary too. <laughs> so we have some questions here. Um, number one question is, how will the information be safe with hackers, cloud security, and if electrical shortage, how to validate and retrieve information? Well, that is, uh, that is the uh, number one question, right? The, um... It came first. <laughs> Is is well. What, what I mean is is uh, one of the most important questions. Is the particular in private sectors you have the um, competing imperative of getting new business of uh, generating profit versus uh, security, and as we've seen with the uh, EIT world, uh, EOT the world, uh, uh, sorry, IOT world, um, the businesses have tend to. Um, um, prefer profit over security. <laughs> okay, so I would say the only way we can make this happen is as a consumer, um, we make very clear to, to these uh, vendor that uh, unless they have the security, we're not gonna patronize them. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in terms of the, uh, on the government size, um, there are also a lot of initiatives to set up standards for security and protection. Um, but a lot more works need to be done. I, I definitely agree. And the second question is, which party will be responsible for mistakes, possibly loss of human life, made by AI routines, for example, medical diagnosis, whoever used the AI or the AI developer? Yeah, another great question. Well, this is why I said, if you're a lawyer, <laughs> this will be could be a very fruitful uh, avenue. In fact, it's probably a new field of law developing out of this. Uh, and, and, um, ultimately, I would say this is really a um, social question, meaning that is um, I don't think there's any technical or, or logical answer to this. It's a question of from our society's uh, our perspective, how do we want to design the responsibility? And obviously, we do want some sort of responsibility. We don't just want to throw up a hand and say, hey, it's, it's AI. Nobody's responsible. Right? So that, that would certainly not be an acceptable answer, I would say. Okay. Sorry, I don't really have an answer for you. That's not, we're, yeah. we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah, it's still developing. So another question is, are you aware of any local or state tax departments using the Oracle process to track where an individual lives? Uh, the questioner is thinking, what if he lied that he lived 90% of the time in a low tax state, such as Texas, whereas he actually lived in New York, where he's taxed at, he thinks 90%. Yeah, that's, that's a very, very good question. I mean, I, I'm not aware of any such cases yet, but I can certainly see it happening. I mean, um, you know already that the... Um, um, uh, most of the highway toll has moved away from uh, any of these transponder things to um, a camera taking your license plate because the camera and the recognition technology is so good now. Um, so if you, uh, uh, if you use this uh, highway and then, um, you know, the, 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 it's a matter of the states cooperating and sharing data, which could be, could be an issue, but, but if they're willing to share, It'll be pretty easy for them to find that, hey, your, your car license plate is spending 90% of the time <laughs> in Texas, even though you, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. You, you spend 90% of the time in the New York State, but uh, but you claim you're residing in Texas, right? So, um, yeah, I can definitely see that happening in the future. What about someone else driving your car? Um, actually, I think the cameras are good enough now that they can tell if it's the same person. I didn't get into the whole facial recognition thing, but that's a big, uh, 
big topic in itself. So um, probably not perfect um, um, accuracy uh, when you when you think picture through the car windows, but uh, they can certainly distinguish uh, different people, whether it's the same person. Or not. Okay. Another question is: Does the government have any plan to replace a social security number? with another format which protects privacy or make it more difficult to be misused. Medicare has discontinued the use of social security number for identification. That's another great question. I mean, that is a, um, um, that is a, a um, what well, if the straight answer, simple answer is no, there's no such plan. However, that definitely government is aware of the limitation of uh, social security number. And also for many, many other applications, um, we, we really need to rely on new online identity um, um, technology or services, right? For example, the, um, you know, the Federal Reserve is studying the um, uh, central bank digital currency. And to do things like central bank digital currency, you need to have very robust identity, online identities. So, um, so there, there's definitely a research uh, uh, on this topic, but uh, yeah, no, there's no plan yet to, to move to anything. How about how to identify fake avatar, process, program, et cetera, for individuals? Very difficult right now. This is so new, not enough research really has gone into it. And, um, and people are definitely doing research. And it's one of the areas that I mentioned that is uh is has wide open for a new a new entrepreneur you know if you have a new idea how to do this start a business there'll be a lot of people knocking on the door this is <laughs> uh, now uh, there are concerns that the government and private companies for example facebook google amazon apple have massive data on us mm -hmm. what if they use ai to control or manipulate us it's and not what if, it's, it's already happening, right? I mean, you, you've seen all this new discussion about Facebook, but every single platform business is trying to do this. I'm not saying nefariously. I mean, they're looking to make money off of what they have, which is the data. So, but where that, where the part of that, uh, the privacy of you versus their profit, um, you know, without regulation, I don't see them prioritizing your privacy over the profit mode. So. Uh, so yeah, it's not a question of if, it's a question of how and what kind of consequences uh, uh, there is on us as, as individuals. So what are the regulations that are available out there? Um, I would say U.S. is notably um, kind of lagging in the, a lot of these type of regulation. Uh, the most well-known and advanced, uh, not the most advanced, the most well-known in software is GDPR from uh, from Europe. Um, California has a version of it, some a slight different emphasis, um, but uh, I, I don't see the federal government itself coming with a U.S. version of GDPR anytime soon. It's because um, many of the areas are controversial, and as we know, many of these uh, big tech companies what that owns all these data. They have they have a lot of influences too. So, um, and, and obviously, a lot of the areas are still um, open for research. Like, um, what is like what is the best policy? Where is where is your best balance? Um, many of these are very difficult questions. Also, in many cases, they're going to be societal questions. They're not really there are no technical answers. They're just what is willing people willing to live with. So. I think that's one of the purposes for discussion like this is to make us more aware of the different issue and help us understand where we feel the balance should be. Okay, so what about governments using facial recognition and cell phone to track the people? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure the question. It certainly has happened in individual cases, right? I mean, the, the uh, um, in even movies knows about it, right? People movie, you see people buying burner phones, <laughs> switching SIM cards in the movie, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a fact. I'm not quite sure what the question is. 
So that's no regulation? Uh, there are some regulations, um, but I, I would say it's not that strong. Okay. Part of the reason is that it's our cell phone technology, our current G Gen 3, including even G4 technology, ha also has very little security implemented. It's all in plain text that if you buy a cell tower imitator, you can collect every conversation that's going on in your um, neighborhood. You know, um, only in G3 is there more serious consideration of building security inside this cell tower protocol. So, um, so, so since it's in plain text, there's no regulation. Any anybody who can buy one of those devices can listen to what you say in the cell phone. Thank you so much, Arno. Our time is up, and I wish to thank Arno and our audience. We hope that you have enjoyed our webinar. The recording will be posted on the website of the MIT Chinese Alumni Group and also the YouTube channel of the MIT Alumni Association. For the MIT community, please join the MIT Chinese Alumni Group. You don't have to be Chinese. <laughs> For the public, please link in with me and message me to be added to our invite list. Let us unite and help one another. On behalf of Arnold Chu, the MIT Chinese Alumni Group, we thank you and hope to see you again. <laughs>